Hey, good evening. Welcome to Growers Live. This is Josh Satin with No-Till Growers. Happy New Year, everybody. Hopefully everyone had a great holidays with families and friends and just had a good time and are getting back at it now. Um, super, super excited about tonight's guest. Um, as you guys know from the title, we have Dr. Elaine Ingham on tonight, and um, I couldn't be happier to have her here. She's just an amazing lady and done some amazing work for so many people. So um, I got a couple of announcements uh, before we get into this, so I just want to get through those as quickly as I can so that we can get to, to Elaine. Um, first of all, the Growers Live schedule is um, going to be changing a little bit. Um, we are going to do less shows. I think that's really the, the gist of it is that um, we're not going to be doing them every week. We're probably going to be doing them maybe once or twice a month. We haven't really decided yet. Um, and partly the reason, just to be really clear with you guys, is that it does take a lot of time on top of whatever, what else we're, we have going on. And Jesse and I are pretty busy with things. And so the bigger thing also is this, the, and I, I hate asking us for money, but the Patreon page and trying to get more support, it's just we can't afford to do all the stuff that we want to do right now. So if you guys really consider uh, helping out over there, that would be greatly appreciated. I know we ask you guys a lot um, just to help with the podcast, with the video production. We're putting out more videos on the No-Till Growers YouTube page. If you guys haven't seen that, there's tons of cool stuff coming out, and those are going to be just streaming out as as you know on a regular basis and getting a lot of cool stuff out to you guys. Um, another announcement is um, if you guys haven't already seen or heard about or thinking about whatever the conference we're doing in San Diego on February fifteenth with Jared Smith of Jared's Real Food and Stephen Cornett Majors Always Right. Uh, there's still tickets available. Uh, Jesse and I booked our plane tickets and we are going and. We're excited. So not just Jesse. Jesse's part of the presentation as well. But I'm going to be there filming and talking to everybody. So if you want to come hang out with me too, uh, please consider that. It's going to be a great time. Um, it's also February in San Diego. So that'll be nice for a lot of us. Um, tonight for the, sh the show, the moderator, um, Jackson, is uh, is going to be in there. He's the third member of the No-Till Growers group. So he's going to be over there moderating the chat. Uh, Jesse's off tonight. Um, and then I think that's it. So let's get Elaine in here. Um, I don't think I have anything else, and you don't want to listen to me ramble anyways. Let's, let's get Elaine in here, and uh, super, super excited. Elaine, welcome. How are you? Oh, glad, glad to be here. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. just been raining in Oregon, where I live, so not having to deal with snow and ice and all that horrible stuff. <laughs> Yeah, we don't get too much of that in uh, North Carolina. I'm originally from Boston, so I'm like totally used to it. And I know you said you're from Minnesota, so yeah, it's even that's even snowier. But um, now that I'm living down here, it's like maybe once a year we get a snowstorm and and that's it. So um, it's been pretty warm this winter. Uh, but so I just want to uh, give you an opportunity um, to um, to share, um, you know, sort of what you have going on. I don't think I need. Most people, I think, know who you are, Elaine. I'm just, I'm just making the assumption. If they're tuning in, they know who you are, what you kind of do. Um, but if you want to give a little bit of a background or, um, you know, sort of talk a little bit about some of the things that you're doing right now in terms of the, the school and the classes and things like that, I'd, I think that would be a really good time to share that. Yeah, and I would welcome the opportunity to talk about the school and the classes and things. Well, so a little bit of background uh, about myself. Um, uh, Josh was just saying that I grew up in Minnesota and um, I went to uh, high school, college, St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, all that good. Umyaya was the the cheer for the college in sports. So from uh, Minnesota, <laughs> the first time I left Minnesota and realized that you didn't have to deal with six feet of snow during the winter time and that it would disappear long before Easter. Um, uh, decided me. I went to Texas A&M for my master's degree in marine microbiology. And then from there, I went to Colorado State University, which, you know, they do get a little bit of snow. And um, But their, their attitude about snow is you drive to it to go skiing all day. And then you turn around and ba drive back down to where it isn't snowing. And I thought that was a perfect way to deal with snow. Yeah, I lived so, out there for five um, years. So I totally understand that. Yeah. Yep. I lived out there for nine years oh, um, doing my PhD work and then postdocing there for another four or five years, um, trying to understand what it was that all of these organisms in soil actually did. When I was working on my PhD, uh, my major professor said, well, you really ought to go around to all of the professors that work with uh, soil and get their opinion 
about um, microorganisms in soil and what they do and how important they were. And so I went to every soils person, agronomist, horticulturalist, landscape person, all of the different departments. And it was almost invariably go in and say, well, I want to work on all these different organism groups in the soil and figure out what they do and why they are important in growing plants. And their response was, uh, they don't do anything important for plants. They're just sort of there. Those organisms are just, they're there. Don't worry about them. You're, you're going to have a really bad PhD research project. No one's going to care about anything that you do because uh, these organisms in the soil are, they don't do anything. And that was, even for me at that time, I was thinking in the back of my head, um, that's crazy. Mother Nature doesn't keep organisms around. She doesn't keep species around if they're doing nothing. If there is no positive or negative or you know, there's, they're there for a purpose. And we've got to figure out what that purpose is. And so my husband was, um, who is an nematologist and um, his critters eat my critters. Um, so of course we have very interesting um, dinnertime conversations about which one of my bacteria are turning around and eating his nematodes. And it, uh, yeah, my kids both went into the world of entertainment because we talked too much science when they were around. So um, my son is an opera singer <clears throat> and he has a full-time job at uh, the opera house in um, uh, um, Mainz, Germany. And my daughter works for ESPN regional and uh, yeah, does all the special events coordinating for the regional, for the under, uh, for the collegiate um, ESPN. So that was kind of interesting. The effects of, of um, n talking too much science to young people is, um, no, let me escape, get, all get right, but, out of but, here. But we <laughs> want to talk about science tonight, right? So, uh, <laughs> yep. so tell, me about, tell yep. me about the Soil Food Web School and what sort of courses you're offering and, and sort of some of that stuff. And like, uh, also like who, who these courses are for and who might be interested in checking them out. Yep. So over the years of finding out what these organisms actually do and how important they are and really they are the things that your plant works with to make certain that the soil that it's growing in meets the criteria, meets the needs of that particular plant. And we as growers need to figure out um, which of these organisms are promoting the plant you want to grow. What are the requirements in your soil so that the microorganisms in your plants can work together and achieve maximum production. So um, over the years, uh, working with all of um, growers all over the world, um, visiting, I visited pretty much every country I have ever, ever had a desire to get to. Some night I didn't really want to get to, but I got there anywhere. Um, working with growers, trying to help them get this biology what is the appropriate ratio of fungi to bacteria? How many protozoa do you need? What are the nematodes? Which kind of nematodes? Which are the good guy protozoa and which are the bad guy? Which are the good guy fungi and the bad guy fungi? And one thing people had not realized until I really kind of started pushing it was the concept that it, the beneficial organisms require aerobic conditions. The root system on your plant is obligately aerobic. And if you allow compaction, if you allow those anaerobic conditions to develop in or around the root system, you're going to be in trouble. The bad guys are going to take over. And so now how do you get the good guys back in there? What do you do? What are the steps? And that's what we teach in the foundation courses that we offer through Soil Food Web School. We have just recently updated. Um, all of the classes, so it's uh, the latest and greatest information. Now, there's still a lot we don't know, and I have no trouble saying we don't know this yet. To the best that we have any data, we think this is how it's working, but we need solid data, and we need that kind of data from growers. So we're very interested in working with people and helping mentor you, give you um, understanding. So the foundation courses are, first of all, the, the theory, the uh, mechanisms, the reasons why these organisms are good for your plant. How does your plant communicate with these organisms? How do they respond back? What do they do for the plant? 
and you just have to remember that there's no one size fits all because if you have a catastrophic catastrophic disturbance you're basically going to be left with nothing but photosynthetic bacteria in your dirt it's really dirt it's not soil at that time and we've got to start to build that biology and pretty soon you'll get to a place where the biology allows for the growth of weeds it grow, allows for the growth of not very productive grasses and some veggies. Keep building that food web and you're going to now have a set of microorganisms that will promote things like the brassica, the coal and the kales and the mustard plants. Well, keep building that and now you're going to get some um, healthier, some more productive grass species. So you're starting to develop meadows and grasslands and pastures. Keep building that biology, the vegetables like our carrots and potatoes and tomatoes are going to grow bumper crops instead of weak, scrabbly little um, plants that you can't sell much. So improving productivity. Then we're going to go over the edge into a fungal dominated soil. So up till everything I'm talking about up to here, you're um, basically still bacterial dominated. It's just getting less and less bacterial dominated as you go through that shift in the plant species, as you go through succession is the ecological term for that. And then of course you get into a whole fungal dominated system, you're going to be growing bushes and shrubs, blueberries, roses, uh, 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 berries of many kinds. So then you move into deciduous forests. And finally, very fungal dominated, lots of bacteria still there, but way more fungal dominated. You get into the conifer and the evergreen forests. So what kind of plant are you trying to grow? And what kind of problems do you have? And we're going to make certain that you can, that we will be able to match the biology in the soil to the plant that you want to grow. And then you start to see um, all of these benefits to the plant. And so I assume we'll probably get through all of those highly beneficial um, things that these organisms can do. Nutrient cycling. There, there is no reason to be putting any inorganic fertilizer into your soil ever again. You do not have to, <clears throat> you should not be the one who is balancing your mineral nutrients. That That's just completely unnecessary because the plant will do that. The plant's going to put out exudates from its root system to make the particular species it needs to go and do particular jobs. So we have to make certain that the bacteria and the fungi are present so that when the plant puts out those foods into the soil, the microorganisms respond and do what the plant needs. Go out and collect nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium from the sand, the silt, the clays, the rocks, the pebbles. There is no reason to be putting on inorganic fertilizers. All of those inorganic fertilizers are compounds. They're salts that will kill your microorganisms and make it impossible for you to be able to grow the plants you want without spending a lot of money. So get the I, biology I, in the soil and absolutely. you'll be able yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean I think I know like I'm on board with that completely. Um I just want to ask you a little bit about the course courses because I know that's something that you're trying to promote right now too. Um what um I know we were talking a little bit before we started, but you were saying, you know, there's a lot of the reasons why and some theory and stuff ahead of time so people can understand. And I, I think that's a great approach for anything in life. You should understand, you know, why things work because then you can apply it in other situations. But, um, and you also mentioned that, you know, it'll be on for, there'll be content in there for different scales from really small scale up to very large scale. But, you know, who is the kind of person, if I'm watching this or interested in the, the information that you have, like what kind of people uh, are you targeting with this course? Or who do you think it's a good course for, you know, for people to sign up for? Well, it's for people who don't want to have to work as hard, growing really high quality crops, crops that have all of the nutrients in it. And so it's going to be helping your digestive system, your animal's digestive system. You're not going to be having erosion problems. You're not losing nutrients. We should never see nutrients leach or be lost from the soil because they should be kept in that soil through the 
microorganisms that take up and hold those nutrients. Then when your plant starts growing and it wants lots of nutrients, it's going to make sure that the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods are moving back into the soil, all this great food, releasing the nutrients so the plants can take them up. If the plant doesn't take it up, then the bacteria and fungi grab those soluble nutrients again. So we, a lot of times people have gotten caught in this trap of looking at just soluble nutrients when that is not the important thing, unless the only thing you're gonna be using is inorganic fertilizers. So people who wanna move away from having to be, having to put on toxic chemicals, inorganic fertilizers are toxic chemicals. Pesticides of any kind are toxic pesticides, they're toxic chemicals. And that means you're harming yourself, you're harming your children, you're harming the animals on your property. You're destroying the very organisms that you have to have in your soil in order to not have to use those pesticides or inorganic fertilizers so that you don't have to till. So you don't have to do all this work in maintaining this agricultural system. I like to think of it as uh, we want to teach you how to set the, the system, the soil in motion. You plant, you plant your seeds, you plant your starts, you make sure the biology is in that soil, you turn around, you walk away, and you don't come back until harvest. You should not have to be out there dealing with a different disease uh, every week. You right. should never have to be out there spraying something every week. Now, if you've got neighbors who are still putting on boatloads of toxic chemicals, a little drift may happen and okay, you're gonna to have to recover that biology, but it's a one-time application typically at that point to recover the biology that just got zapped a little bit by a toxic chemical used by a neighbor and the wind drifted it over onto your property. Okay. So um, that's, um, that's what we go through in the classes. So the okay. first class is the theory. The second class is how do you make compost so you can be growing all your own organisms in the proper balances for the plants that you want to grow. Um, the next one is what if it's easier for you to apply a liquid version of compost? And so we teach people how to make extracts and teas that you can get all the same benefits of these microorganisms building soil structure, getting your roots to go deeper, reducing water use on your property. Um, you know, no weeds. Weeds are a er very early successional stage of a plant. And so if you um, are having weed problems, Mother Nature is trying to tell you that you don't have anywhere close to the right sets of microorganisms. Please start working, getting these organisms up. We can jumpstart moving. We can move to the right stage of succession in the very first growing season. So awesome. that first growing season is a little, yeah, that's gonna be the toughest time that you have to get all these organisms reestablished probably. Uh, but after that, it's really very easy. So um, we want to teach you all of that. And so liquid composts can work very well. And then you want a tool that you can measure the biology in your soil. If you can't measure it, you can't um, you know, take care of it. You can't manage it. So what is the tool that you're always going to use whenever you have a question? Is the biology adequate? Why aren't these tree, trees growing well? Why are, aren't my tomatoes doing well? Why aren't my onions doing well? Let's take a look at the soil and you go, okay, well, I don't have enough fungi in here. I only have bad guy fungi, I don't have good guy fungi. And so we teach you how to identify those kinds of problems and then what do you have to do to fix those problems? So that the foundation courses are a package that we like to um, sell all together. We then do have a practical training course or a consulting, a consultant training course where we hold your hand basically while you're actually learning how to make compost. You know, there's always that difference between theory and practice. Oh yeah, this sounds really easy. Well, yeah, but you better make a compost pile or two before you're really capable of going, oh, yeah, it's easy. Uh, you make a lot of stumbles. You make a lot of well, I, people are always, we don't have to follow your recipe exactly, Elaine, do we? Uh, well, yeah, you kind of do. Unless you, you get, want. Yeah, you got to get some yeah. going. You got to be, you got to like make it work first. I agree. Right. 
see um, how you can do it po properly. Um, and then how to make um, compost teas and how to make extracts. And then we want you to do a project where you start out, you document that you're dealing with dirt. Now, what are the steps to convert that dirt back into soil? And we want to see you do that. And we're going to help you. We'll be there to mentor you every step along the way. So when you sign up for that class, you get a mentor. And that mentor has been through that process many times themselves. And so they are very good at helping somebody else come along. Cool. Well, that sounds awesome. I'm, I'm glad to hear a little bit more about the course. And for anyone interested, check out soulfoodweb.com. Um, I want to get in some questions, Elaine. Um, and so just as everyone should know, the, the format usually is uh, we take questions from Patreon members first. So we'll announce what the guests are. And then if, you, if you're if you a Patreon member, you can, you can get questions in ahead of time. And then we'll go to the live questions in the chat. So in future episodes, if you guys like to get some questions in for the guests, that's how you do it. Uh, and if you haven't already, guys, hit the like button down below. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, all right. So, Elaine, here we go. First question. Uh, Ramblin' Farmers uh, says, so stoked Dr. Elaine is on the show again. Um, can you address the common assumption that farmers can't add more organic matter or compost because their soil test says um, potassium and phosphorus are too high? Um, looking at farms like Singing Frogs and other long-term deep compost mulch system, obviously the P and K is not a major issue and or is being misrepresented in chemistry soil tests that don't address biological cycling. So Yeah, and the problem is that, you know, people don't, people who don't work with biology and they haven't understood the soil food web principles, um, they haven't understood organic principles at all. Um, they think compost is something where you just take organic matter, throw it in a big pile and let it do its thing. And it's typically going to go anaerobic. And as soon as you go anaerobic, you have all kinds of toxicity problems. The pH is really low. You're going to have um, um, holding on to the potassium or the sodium or salts in that compost. They may get manure from a place that's inappropriate. If animals are being fed um, food sources that have antibiotics in them, those antibiotics come through the com through the manure, and then you add that manure to your compost, thinking that it's a good high source of nitrogen to get those bacteria and fungi growing really, really rapidly and generating the temperature to kill the pathogens and the pests. No, it's not going to do that because you've got anti antibiotics in that compost, in that manure. And so how can you grow the organisms that are going, you're going to, to be needed by your plant? Um, you're going to lose the organisms that will hold on to those salts, convert those salts into a non-toxic form that's organic. So they're putting on a ha-ha compost. And that's where compost has gotten its bad name. It really came into being when we started to have landfills. What did people 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, what did they do with their waste products? Well, they, every single person out in the farm, out and away from the cities, um, had their own compost pile. And it was, little, it was the youngest kids who took care of the compost pile. And they had pretty rapidly learned that you don't let it burst into flames, that you do everything pro properly. It's not until we see city dwellers really becoming um, a huge portion of the population. And even there, there used to be the night soil person, and they would come around and collect all the garbage, all the waste, all the manure, human manure, and then they would go out to their farm and they would make compost with it. And then they would sell that compost back to the very person, people they were getting their starting materials from. And of course, nobody ate too much salt and nobody ate antibiotics. So you didn't have to worry so much. Right. But it's so, with landfills here that the problem really started because we weren't um, keeping, we weren't, we weren't composting properly. So I don't, I, you know, I don't mean to keep interrupting you and not letting you talk. Go ahead. No, not at all. I just wanted to uh, sort of redirect that question a little bit, just that um, there's a lot of no-till growers out there now that, are sort of applying what we're calling a deep compost mulch system. And so instead of 
you know, like you're talking a lot about, you, you mentioned about making compost teas and things like that to increase the biology, but a lot of farmers in, in this world are sort of just putting more and more compost. And you're right, there might be a huge variety in terms of quality of the compost. Um, but I think there's also a lot of people that are using really like either professionally made compost or, you know, not just like putting manure on and stuff like that. And there's talk about, um, you know, increasing levels of like phosphorus, for example. Um, and so does that become a problem? Should you then like just stop adding compost? I know there's the other talk about is leaching issues with runoff and that sort of stuff too. But I think that's sort of what the question was asking. It was like, if they're getting their soil test back and they're too high, should they just stop adding compost? Um, they need to find a different compost. Okay. They need to find somebody who's composting properly because if you have all the food web organisms present in that compost pile, you're not going to accumulate salts. And that's what the problem is. There's a accumulation of salts. Why, where are the salts coming from? Well, inappropriate um, conditions in that composting process. It's going anaerobic and you're going to start getting salt accumulation in certain places. There's a lot of toxic compounds that are being made. It's not composting correctly. It's not aerobic composting. So we want to make certain that all the right organisms, the indicator organisms, are the aerobic guys. And then you can be assured nutrient cycling is happening within that pile. Those um, inorganic mineral salts are being incorporated into the structure of the organic matter. And so you can put on as much of that compost as you want. I like to grow my plants in pure compost. And as long as you're doing a good job of making that compost aerobic, you don't have any of the diseases, you don't have any of the pests. The really beneficial organisms build soil structure. So they, the bacteria, those aerobic bacteria make the glues to bind the little tiny micro aggregates together. And then the fungi can come along and with their hyphae, they're going to pull those micro aggregates into macro aggregates. And now you've got massive amounts of space and air, water coming through, hold being held in the pore structure within that soil, not draining out of your soil the way it does in a sand soil. You, you've got to build, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with a clay soil, you've got to make them little tiny aggregates, pull it all together, and then pull those aggregates together so you have space so water can move through. If you've got sand, you've got to bind some organic matter to those sands and build them into aggregates so that you hold water against the flow of gravity. There is no leaching of nutrients. The only thing that comes out of a good healthy soil with all the right biology in it is clean water because all those nutrients are held on the surfaces of the sands, the silts, the clays, the organic matter, all that structure holds all those nutrients in place and you lose nothing or a very small amount. And so all of the water at the bottom of the hill is um, that's collecting is clean, it's fresh, you can drink it. No more ponds that you are afraid to drink from because something, you know, some toxic chemical is being released or there's an accumulation of potassium or um, nitrate or any one of those inorganic nutrients. Okay, All so you're those saying problems go away. Okay, so you're saying that it's more about the process and and how the compost is made, and not necessarily <laughs> the ingredients. Like, will the ingredients make a difference? Like, they're going like if if one compost is made with manure and one is not, or one has more you know different balance of things, um, will that affect like the salts that are in there, or it, it's just the it, it's just the way it's composted and how those are chemically bonded to the other nutrients that are in there. Yep, and that's and that's where you really need to take the that foundation course number one because okay. we go through why do you need ten percent nitrogen, thirty percent green, and you need sixty percent woody. Woody materials are fungal foods, and that's what we're lacking most of the time in the soil. So we've got to grow a lot of really good fungi. So fungal foods, 60% of the pile. We don't want them coming from places where they've been putting on a horrible amount of um, pesticides, a horrible amount of inorganic fertilizer, because you could well be starting from a bad place that's going to be killing your organisms. And so you really want to be careful about what kinds of materials you put into your piles. Now you can put some, <clears throat> excuse me, you can put some 
but you can't have all of that pile been impacted, grown with a lot of toxic chemicals. 30% green material, that's bacterial food. And then the high nitrogen is what gets the bacteria and fungi to start growing really fast and producing the temperatures that will kill the pathogens and the pests and the problem organisms. We can also compost for a long time and hope that earthworms move into your pile, that just by having the good guys, good aerobic conditions, that eventually over the course of one to two years, um, those problem organisms are gonna be dealt with by all the beneficial organisms. You can make worm compost. So passage through the earthworm's digestive system, <clears throat> excellent way to inoculate some really good microorganisms that live inside the digestive systems of the earthworms. And so the worm compost that comes out the other end is really choice, choice material. It's got the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes. You just have to pay attention to how much woody or how much green you're putting into that bin. So you're making certain the organisms that's, that are coming out of that worm bin, that worm compost is fungal dominated if that's what you need, or is bacterial dominated if that's what you need. Those ratios of fungi to bacteria, we've got to get them right so that we select for the plant you want and not for something else. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, because I think that there's, I mean, it, it's complicated, obviously, but there's, I think a lot of no-till growers are really, you know, compost heavy. We're using a lot of compost. Um, and so I think there's been, I know I've been involved in discussions where people are talking about excess night, uh, excess nutrients. And um, so that was that, that's really where that question is coming from. And I know some growers have switched from like a compost that had manure to a compost that didn't have manure. Um, after they got their, you know, the levels where they wanted to. Um, but you're saying that it's mainly like if it's composted properly, it should all be sort of incorporated. Yep. All of okay. those, all, you won't have any excess of uh, any salt. Well, it, okay. It's not going to happen. Okay. And <clears throat> so it's like a, when you're starting out with soil that you just bought from somebody else and the only things present in it, in it is the bacteria you are going to want to put out compost at um, <clears throat> rates that are going to help you convert that soil into a much better biology right away before you ever put in a crop. Get that change starting to happen as soon as you can. Okay. And my favorite time to put down a good compost is in the fall and let those organisms have all winter long to do their thing and start improving the biology. Every day that the soil is not actually frozen, those organisms are gonna be building the soil for you. Uh, if you get a layer of snow on the surface of the soil, that protects that soil surface, and those microorganisms are gonna work every day, all day, improving your soil through that whole winter time period if they're protected. So okay. a lot of people that may have um, freezing temperatures, or they may not, they may put down a mulch layer on top of their compost so that those organisms will be functioning all through that winter time period. When you come back in the spring and you look at your soil, it's almost there. You just have to maybe do a little bit of adjusting. And we can do that with, um, um, if you do put in a start, let's make sure that that compost that you're using in the uh, little um, seedling trays that that's got exactly the right ratio of fungi to bacteria because then all those plants start ahead of anything else you want to talk about. If you can't put in compost, uh, well, then in your furrow, put down a compost extract, put it underneath the seed, some spray, spritz your seeds with this biology, and then plant um, seeds that have already got the right organisms on them. So the second that root um, starts to come out, the correct biology is going to be selected for build structure, get rid of the compaction layers. Okay. So this isn't a time... question. This isn't a question from, uh, from anybody, but um, would you say that generally commercially made compost is mainly just bacteria dominated? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, I, we've had lots of people that we've been working with, all of our consultants, all of the people in the FC courses right now. We ask them to go out and get a sample from all of the composting operations around them. And if it's a municipal composting yard, that's not compost. Sorry, that's putrefied organic matter. Call it what it is. It will kill your plant usually, or it will usually it will usually slow things down massively. So if you buy compost from a facility like that, you look at it and you realize that this is not good stuff. It smells bad. It's black. It's slimy. It's uh, just disgusting. You know, you get all that oily stuff on your fingers. That's anaerobic. And now you're going to have to go and get an inoculum from someplace, mm -hmm. add that into the compost, and you're going to have to be turning. You're going to have to be getting that good biology throughout that pile so you convert it over into something that's not going to hurt your plants but could actually help. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people I know around the country and obviously around the world that struggle to get high-quality compost from a commercial manufacturer because there's just a lot of places where they don't exist. So yep. I think that's that's a real struggle for a lot of people. And I think that, you know, you always have to work with what you got. And uh... and that's one thing we want to do at So Food Web School is okay. to start working with people and have um, biocomplete compost um, made at those particular places. So like this next year, we're going to be working out exactly what our um, what is the way to set up these companies that would make biocomplete compost and will be able to spread around the world and be that source of the really good compost so people don't have to make it themselves. Well, of course, if you're a, if you're a grower that you really like to keep it all in hand and you want to know everything about every step, then you come and you work with us and we teach you how to make that compost. So you can make it for your farm and maybe for your neighbors. Um, sure. And then all of a sudden you discover that it's a lot um, a better um, you know, job making compost for everybody else than it is to actually grow food. I was just going to say, I think there's a lot of money to be made in, in making compost for sure. Um, I know there's a lot of people just looking for it and they, they don't have access to it. So, And it's a specialized yeah. job that, you know, as a, as personally as a farmer, like I'm not a great compost maker. I buy it because I have other things I'm doing and spending my time on and I'm going to pay someone to, to do that for me. Um, so I want to get to a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. You want to have, you want to have good compost. So you got to, you have to work with the people who are, you're buying from to encourage them to keep improving, encourage them to pay attention. And that's where you'd really like to send them to the um, SC courses and get them <laughs> to understand. Awesome. Um, be like, Hey, your compost could be better. You should go, you go, go talk to Elaine yep. or go take her course. And it's, and it's like people we've started working with. They've uh, been, they initially were selling their compost for, you know, 35 to $55 per cubic yard. And wow. today they're selling their compost for $750 a cubic yard because wow. people know it's worth it. Right. They're, they're going to see the improvements. They're going to get these benefits. They don't have to be forking out money to the chemical companies, which everybody just hates doing that. But they, you've, they've been convinced that that's the only way. You can't grow plants with all, all of this toxic chemical. Well, think another thought because sure. we do it all the time. Okay. I got a question from David Blanchard. Um, he said, I'd like to hear Dr. Ingham's comments on, quote, the new view of soil organic matter, i.e. that is mostly of microbial origin rather than biochemically recalcitrant. I can't say that word very well. Uh, uh, humic substances. Do, do you know? Yeah. Okay. Do, yeah. And have I have to agree that? with them completely. I, okay. I agree completely. Um, organic matter in the soil is processed by microorganisms. The only thing they can decompose leaf material or, or stems or flowers or any part of any plant material has to be decomposed by microorganisms. So it's not just like a chemical, you've got water rushing and moving through your soil and it's leaching out all of this simple, easy stuff and getting lost downhill. And what's left are these really recalcitrant materials. No, that's not how it works. You have to have biology to do those jobs. So yeah, the whole um, soils, chemistry, 
has to start understanding biology. Um, they've been ignoring, they've been pretending that the processes just magically happen. It's done by microorganisms. It's done by all these creatures in the soil and there is no other way to achieve it. If you take some plant um, organic material and you sterilize it, you get rid of all of the organisms, nothing happens. Right. It doesn't magically become humic acid after 10 years or something. It will just sit there and look at you. Okay. Whereas if you have the right biology, it's going to be humic acid in the course of two or three days. So I say, I always have to laugh when you know, souls people say, oh, humic acids, uh, their half-life is 500 years. Really? It uh, doesn't meet, meet my observations. So there's just a whole transition that has to occur once you start understanding biology and you're we're right here at the beginning of this whole change. Okay. Um, so I got, all right, I will get to this question first. Um, Henry Allison asks, uh, what's, what's your view on uh, the John Kemp style feed the plant like sprays, et cetera, healthy plants equals healthy soils through improved photosynthesis and more sugars to the microbes rather than the common mantra of feed the soil to create healthy plants? Um, he's going after kind of a foliar approach there where um, the observations have been made that if you're spraying these compounds, these compounds can be taken up through the stomata. And there's some pretty good whole system um, um, models of where most of the nutrients come from in plants. And it's not through the foliage. You can't feed a plant everything it needs through the above ground foliar system. It's just not possible. Um, so, you know, it's sort of like saying, well, if we just put your arms into a really good vitamin mix, your body will take it up. Well, yeah, it will, but not enough to keep you alive and happy. So, I think we have to have the biology in the soil, but you do want to be using kind of a, a topping off. You're, you'll get that last little oomph into the plant if you're paying attention to foliar applications. But the foliar applications I want are the microorganisms who are going to follow the directions of the plant. The plant knows what it needs. The plant's putting out the exudates to tell which bacteria, which fungi should be waking up and growing because I need to get the more zinc, I need more boron, I need more nitrogen, I need more whatever. And so these microorganisms go out. Using their enzymes, they will pull those nutrients out of the sand, say, sand the soil, the clay, Ooh. the sand, the silt, there we go, not soil, <laughs> silt and clays out of the organic matter itself as well, um, and um, convert that all into organic forms of nutrients. Then when those bacteria and fungi get eaten by protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, et cetera, that releases the nutrients in the form that the plant wants right there at the surface of the root system. So that communication between the plant and the organisms is critically important. Well, where do exudates come from? Well, exudates come from photosynthesis. Those are the sugars that are being made by the plant. So most of the photosynthate that a plant makes goes down into the root system and is releases, uh, released as exudates to feed the microorganisms in the soil. Well, some of that photosynthate goes to the leaves and those exudates are put out through the stomates to feed the bacteria and fungi, which causes the protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods to be doing their job and making those nutrients available back to the plant in a plant available form. So understanding photosynthates, what are the sugars that are being produced and how is your plant altering those things? So if you're measuring plant sap, there's the important part. There's the something that could be really useful for us as growers. What is your plant doing? And if we can get that revealed that oh, see, we've got this kind of sugar showing up in your sap, then this means that X, Y, Z is lacking. So your plant has to make that special sugar 
to get the microorganisms to do the work so the plant gets what it needs so it can be healthy. We've, again, just, you know, just started trying to understand these systems. So, you know, most soils people's attitude about measuring bricks or plant sap, concentrations of sugars and proteins, amino acids, things like that, has been, oh, it's not very useful because you've got to know whether it's a cloudy day or if it's rainy, what's the humidity, what's the temperature, because con the concentrations of d these different sugars in the plant sap is going to vary based on those things. So it's, you know, it's, it varies too much. Well, I think they've been missing the boat on this one. Um, the plant is revealing. It could be useful for us to try to, un to assess what's going on with that photosynthate because then that's what's telling them bacteria and fungi in your soil what to do. So do you do a lot with plant sap analysis and BRICS readings? I, I try to. It's, okay. um, it's like one more thing I should be assessing. It's, you know, we go out and we do a site assessment and we're, we want to look at compaction. So we're out there with the old penetrometer trying to figure out how deep is the soil really going until it turns into dirt. And now, you know, we've only got this much soil. I, I love the fact uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, the soils, uh, the U.S. Um, soil um, Department of Agriculture defined soil as only going down four to six inches. It could not go deeper. And I, of course, watching plants grow, it's like, are you crazy? Do you know how far down root systems of corn can go? In yeah. the, like one month, they're down there at 12 feet. So why would we think that soil is only this deep when plants are genetically made to put their root systems down even deeper? You know, it's not unusual for root systems of grasses to go 25 feet. And so that's so, also another way that you were talking about having a way to measure things. So have, that's another metric yeah. that you can use. So, right. okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the bricks, the plant sap does the same thing. We want to, you know, look at how far are your roots growing? We want to be measuring water movement through that soil. So there's all these interesting things to, to do in a site assessment that a lot of people don't even think about. Um, so Christine Albrecht has, she sent a bunch of questions. So I'm trying to pick up one or two in, in here. Um, one question uh, you sort of already talked about the, the right ratios of carbon to nitrogen in your compost, but would you recommend people getting their compost? Like if you're, if you have one source, let's say, or two sources, would you recommend people getting it tested uh, independently? Like take a sample and have it tested? Or do you like trust like whatever, if they have analysis that they're providing that that's accurate? Um, it, it would depend very much on who's doing that analysis and exactly what analysis. Chemistry doesn't really tell you much. Um, okay. it, you know, there's just so many variables involved there. Looking at the biology does tell you a lot. And, you know, we, we can teach you how to use a microscope in half a day. And then you want to practice and you want to, you know, be looking at absolutely everything that you can to get that practice in. And we have people that will help you do that. Um, because that really tells you what's been going on through the composting process. Was it fully aerobic? Was it slightly an anaerobic, fairly anaerobic? Or, oh my God. There's nothing but diseases and pests in here. Um, so do you have the right ratios of the fungi to bacteria for the plant that you want to grow? Are the organisms ready and set to help the plant you want to grow, grow extremely well and be highly productive? Or is it going to be diseased? Or is it going to have stress from a lack of nutrients? So it's a really simple way to get a lot of answers without having to pay somebody um, lots of money to get those answers. Okay. Um, another question here is about, you know, sort of if you were to make your own compost, um, you know, obviously everyone's ingredients are different depending where you are in the world. So is there a way to sort of navigate that and make, make a good recipe based on like what's available where or what to look for? Yeah, we, we want to have maximum diversity. Um, diversity is going to come from having lots of different kinds of plant materials in your compost because every plant is putting out different exudates. They have different requirements. So there's going to be a different set of species of bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes on every single surface of every single plant. So we want to be maximizing diversity. 
we don't know what it's going to be like in this next summer's uh, growing season. We, we just don't know. So which microorganisms do you need? I think we have to have them all. So despite whether it's cold and dry or wet and hot or whatever the conditions are, we want to maximize diversity, which means you should have all of those organisms in your compost pile that are indigenous to your part of the country and hopefully for your plant. You're going to get all of that into your compost pile. And so we usually start with just saying we want 10% high nitrogen, but it needs to be lots of different kinds, as many kinds of high nitrogen as you possibly can get without toxic chemicals and without problems like that. With the green materials, we want to have green plant material because it's chock full of all of the sugars and the proteins and the carbs that will grow bacteria. Um, and again, massive diversity. So it's not just one kind of green material. We want five or 10 or, or gosh, if we could have 50, well, maybe that that's a little hard to, to do going everywhere and collecting things. And then for your um, woody materials, we want wood chips because they generally help oxygen flow through your pile right at the very beginning where no structure has been built yet by right. any of the microorganisms. They're still just starting that decomposition. We want you know, other kinds of you know, hay, um, different kinds, lots of different kinds of woody materials if possible, just because it helps increase diversity and then you get lots of different kinds of fungi growing. So it doesn't matter what the weather conditions are this summer, you've got the organisms in your pile to be able to deal with those conditions. So we All have right. the general values. Can you, we're share not those, take, can, you, can you share those rough percentages with people? Just like you're yeah, saying like 10%, 10 high nitrogen, um, 30% green plant material. So harvested when it was green, you can let it dry down after that, but uh, don't let it decompose at all because then you lose those soluble, those simple, easy sugars. And then 60% woody materials, um, maybe something like um, 20 to 30%. Uh, of that would be wood chips. Um, so twigs and branches and um, leaves that fell off the tree because your plant pulled most of the nutrients out of that leaf material before those brown leaves fell to the soil surface. So those are really good um, fungal foods. Uh, so we go through you know, lots and lots of these kinds of examples when um, you're when you take the foundation course number two, where we're gonna go through the whole process of making thermal compost and worm compost and static compost. Cool, all right, awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, so Brad uh, Wiss Mueller is asking, um, basically about permanent ground covers. Um, what about, you know, Anything that you recommend for that? I mean, we all like keeping this, keeping the surface covered with, I don't know, any sort of mulches or any sort of permanent ground cover. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we want to make certain that um, ground, there is no bare soil. Um, bare soil is a real anathema to growing biologically because rainfall is pounding. It's um, every time that drop impacts on the surface of your soil, compaction is starting to happen down at four to six inches. So we've got to cover that soil to pre prevent that problem. We, we want our soil to stay aerobic and our root systems to be able to grow all the way through down as deep as they possibly can. So we want to cover with mulch. Well, it's a lot of work to be putting mulch out every time um, that mulch starts disappearing because the microorganisms in your soil started decomposing that really quickly. So put in cover plants. We want short, low-growing things because we, we don't want to have our cover plants overgrowing your crop plant, especially when it's little. Or if you're growing little crops like you know, microgreens or carrots or um, you know, right at first, even squash can get overrun by a, a cover plant. So short, low-growing, uh, two to three inches tall. Um, we want it to be able to move and grow and cover. So when we till out that uh, furrow where we're gonna drop the seeds into, we want that um, furrow wide enough 
so that we'll not have any of the cover plants out here growing in and overtopping your little seedling as it comes up. We want enough space so that doesn't happen. So we gotta be careful, we gotta pick and choose very carefully. So typically we put in things like dichondra. Um, uh, there's a whole herd of the different isotoma species that are um, gonna be selected by temperatures and moistures. And so the isotomas that you choose for your part of the country, you want the indigenous, the local ones, not something that you picked up from Maine or Southern Florida or something like that. You want it um, local. Um, sometimes you just have to go walking out and look at people's uh, beds of flowers where things are growing in a pretty natural way because selections already happened. Those are the isotomas that you want. Those are the short, low growing plants. We've got a whole list of them on um, the website as well as in the um, FC number one. We talk about uh, what are the right um, choices of cover plants. Here's you know, an example of 25 different ones that might work for you. Of course, when you're dealing with um, shrubby plants, if you grow in berries or you've got grapevines or some, some, something like that, deciduous trees, conifer trees, um, you can have cover plants that are you know, six to um, 12 inches tall. It doesn't matter that much. Um, if you're in a situation where you've got um, rodents that are gonna girdle your tree, okay, you want short, low growing plants. But if you don't have that problem, then you can have taller cover plants around those trees and shrubs. So lots of ideas. We're doing a lot of work um, everywhere. We're going to have our um, biocomplete um, compost production farms. We're going to be experimenting to see which are the really good uh, cover plants that work in that part of the country. And so the more people can um, find this out, establish it, get the lists at work for the different kinds of the co country, the faster all of this will move along. Okay. Um, I, there's a lot of action in the chat. And um, thank you guys for all the questions and a lot of comments and a lot of back and forth going on. It's really cool. Um, I have one more question from Patreon members. We had a lot today. Um, just Elaine, a lot of people had questions for you. This is more than normal. So this is awesome. Um, Joseph's asking, he's got a lot of pine needles uh, right now, he's using them for mulching outside the garden. Is there a way to compost them besides waiting three or four years for them to break down? Yeah, yeah. You would want to um, have a small amount of, of those needles, and you would probably want to let those needles um, um, degas. That really strong pine smell or um, hemlock smell or you know whatever dog fur that you've got, you want that really strong smell of conifer to degas, okay. and then those needles can go into the uh, into the compost pile as woody materials. Um, so uh, you might break them up a little bit. It's you know when you're turning things and you get stabbed by a, a pine needle, it's not too fun. So break them up a little bit if you can. My favorite way of breaking up pine needles is to um, put the pine needles into a 55 gallon drum and then go get my weed eater and just, you know, break them all up so that you get nice little bits instead of those long um, needles that can sometimes be really difficult to turn. Okay, and so that wouldn't be the full 60, you couldn't use that as like the full 60% of your wood. No, you could, okay. no, you would, you'd probably want to hold it down to, you know, something like 10%, maybe 15% of the woody okay. material could be um, pine needles. Okay. Um, We've been there, done that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you got to use what you got, right? That's right. Um, um, Don Eisenberg is asking, this is from the chat now, guys, um, and this was from much earlier. Uh, when you were talking about uh, different toxic, toxins and toxic substances, um, what do you think about BT? How does that fit into this? Well, Bacillus thuringiensis um, is, it, it actually makes, I think nowadays they've discovered it's either five or six different toxins that are produced by BT. And it because there's that combination of that many slightly different toxic materials, um, it doesn't, um, resistance doesn't happen 
um, when you've got that many combinations of toxic materials. So it's much more effective if you're actually using the organism instead of um, genetically engineering something. They only did, they only took one of the toxins and genetically engineered um, the plants. And so that's why we very rapidly um, developed resistance to the BT um, plants and really that that um, toxin is no longer useful because most of the insects have developed resistance to that. So BT, the, the, the bacterium, um, does a, a really good job of growing on the surfaces of the leaves and then when the caterpillar ingests that um, bacterium, it basically causes the digestive system of the caterpillar to shut down and it dies fairly rapidly. And it's not going to be, um, it, you know, Mother Nature put the system together where that's not going to, those six different toxins aren't easily, uh, you can't develop resistance to all six of those materials very rapidly. It, you can't do that. And so that particular bacterium uh, remains quite useful. It doesn't, you know, it's fairly specific on the Lepidoptera. So we're not having problems of it killing lots of other things. It's more or less one of the most specific things out there, but you definitely want to be getting the bacterium. Put that bacterium into, say, a compost tea. When you're starting it, you put the bacterium in. You don't put the whole quart of spores in. You put like a pinch of that, you know, an a sixteenth of a teaspoon goes into your 300 gallon brewer. And then you've got that um, particular bacterium that you spray out over the foliage. And it is something that you really only want to put on foliage um, so that the BD can do its job of dealing with uh, caterpillars. Um, do we need to be using it every year? As you get the biology in your soil healthier and healthier, which means your plant is getting all the nutrients that it requires. It's not stressed. It's not putting out those signals to the insect pests that says, I'm sick, I'm unhealthy. Mother Nature wants you to come along and take me out because I'm not healthy. Um, they don't put out those verbenones. And so you don't have those kinds of disease problems. So if you get the biology right in your soil, you do away with even the need to add something like BT into your compost tea. It's not necessary. Okay, but you're saying if you do need to use it, you say add it to compost tea and just a small amount. Right. That yep. way it's it grows up and it's active in that tea before you, okay. Um, yep. Chris Polk is asking, are PLL, PLFA tests a good measure of soil biology? It's um, those particular, um, you know, what is it? Phospholipid fatty acids, PLFAs, um, are a way of assessing um, or trying to get a handle on species of uh, microorganisms or how many different, uh, how, what's the, um, how many different um, orders or classes of bacteria. And it's really pretty much only useful for bacteria, maybe for fungi. There are a lot of fungi that don't make PLFAs at all. And so what, those micro, those fungi don't count in what's going on in your soil? Yes, they do count because those are some of the most beneficial ones typically. And so they're disregarded. They, you don't know that they're there and that they're giving you a lot of benefit. So I find PLFAs to be fairly um, well, interesting, but incomplete. It's not going to be telling you about everything you want to know. Um, it does take a fair amount of time to get the uh, all those PLL, phospholipid fatty acids uh, assessed. And now you get a big, you know, chart of all the different kinds of these different of microorganisms. And you go... Okay, what does this mean? Does, does this mean I've got good, healthy sets of microorganisms? How does this relate to building soil structure? How does this relate to cycling nutrients that you know my plant can take up immediately? And 
and you know not be stressed and how does this relate to suppressing weeds in the system how does this affect the fungal to bacterial biomass ratio and you can't tell any of that from doing PFL the phospholipid fatty acids so, so it's interesting but there's just a whole boatload of work that's going to have to be done until be, it really becomes useful for growers to extrapolate any, what should I do to improve production by knowing the groups of bacteria that are present. Okay. Um, switching gears a little bit here, uh, Jimmy Allman is saying, uh, wants to know what you think about rotational grazing or agroforestry practices like silvopasture. Um, yeah, you, you don't want your animals out on the pasture longer um, than is healthy for the plants. And it's always this problem of, well, how long is that? So how long can I keep them out there? How do I know when it's time to move them along? And I, and, you know, to me, that's still a little bit of a conundrum. You know, uh, I've talked with Alan Savory, for example, about how do you know when to move your animals along? Well, when, when they've uh, grazed down so much of the, of the grass. Okay, well, animals usually go after a certain few cultivars or a certain two, few species of grasses because they usually taste the best. They're, they've got the most nutrition in, in them, and what they're leaving behind are those things that are mm, not so wonderful. So, well, you should leave the animals out there until they start taking those other things down, too. Uh, okay. I would kind of like to do some studies where we go out and we test the biology in the soil. Maybe we look at plant sap because plant sap is so fast at its response to the impacts that are going on on the plant. So if we're measuring sap from those plants that have been grazed you know how is that going to be a good measure of you better move the animals now because they're starting to take too much and these plants are getting unhappy we know that when grasses are grazed that well when any plant is grazed they are going to release a massive amount of exudate from their root system so could we be measuring for when more than 90% or more than 50% of the plants in the system have you know, shot out the exudates to try to get the bacterium fungi growing, get the protozoa and nematodes to come in and eat them so that just at the time the plant starts to photosynthesize again above ground and it needs all that nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, zinc, all those other nutrients that will allow the plant to grow and grow in the most rapid and fastest, most productive way. We want to know when that is. When So I think we have to start putting together some of these measures in order to really figure out what the effect of grazing is. Okay. Is that research being done or is it something you guys are looking into? That's one of the projects that I'd really like to get looking into. It's okay. a, you know, I've got like six or seven of these kinds of projects that, <laughs> God darn, we really, we really got to get going on this. And, okay, we got the classes in order. We've got the foundation classes. We've got the, um, you know, the CTP, the um, certification of people on the microscope. Okay, we're, that's done. Now we got to move on to, well, let's make biocomplete compost so we always know that we're putting on the right sets of microorganisms. And then after that, which one of these projects is the most important so for us to start spending our money on? Right. Or, or maybe we could get a coalition together and we can have, you know, this group is going to take on this project and this group's going to take on this project and they're going to take on, so we can get them all done at the same time. Yeah. We're talking a lot of, more about collaborative farming, collaborative research um, and like collaborative everything. Like we got to work together because, I know it's, it's just important in so many aspects. Um, I got another question here from Mirabella Akers uh, from East Central Minnesota. Uh, is there a danger of soil getting out of balance when letting spent brewery grains um, decompose around edible perennials or fallow annual beds? Um, I, I'm guessing it's, yeah, I don't th see they're not composting at first. They're just putting it on, I'm guessing. Yeah, and so, you know, that's, yeah, that was going to have to ask that question. Um, assuming that they're putting it out, they, you know, they're, 
I see, I would ra rather use that spent grain as the high nitrogen compost component in your compost pile. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, all of that um, brewing waste is great stuff. The um, yeasts, when you're brewing beer, for example, they are not utilizing most of that high nitrogen. They're breaking down the seed coat. They're breaking down the fairly complex um, woody um, food resources, not the germ of the plant. Most of that is staying intact. And so taking that spent, um, um, the hops and whatever. Uh, They're talking about the grain. So after the grain, I was, yeah. I was a brewer for a long time. So I, yeah, you take the grain out, basically all the sugar has been taken out. And so the grain is left behind. I don't know the structure of it, but you're saying it's high in nitrogen and that could be a, a good source of your yep. compost. So okay. a great source for your compost and especially grains. I'm sitting here trying to remember, okay, the three breweries that we were near, which ones were those? And, uh, yeah. Don't worry about um, it. Don't worry about it. Um, I got a question. can't remember everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I got a question here from Tim Turner is talking about compost. I guess he's near me. We might be buying the compost from the same place. If you get compost that you lay out and it's starting to, a lot of mushrooms are popping up. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Is there something you should do about that? It's, um, it says at least you've got some pretty good fungi in there because they're taking over the food resources in that pile and it's producing those fungal structures. However, it says you're limited in diversity typically because fungi have to have a massive amount of energy in order to produce those uh, mushrooms above ground uh, or to produce truffles, for example. And so if you're only seeing one or two kinds, that means you don't have enough diversity. It's kind of Mother Nature's way of saying, oh, you did pretty good. At least you got some good fungi growing in here. But uh, next year or next pile, let's up the amount of inoculum. Let's get you know, another five or six different species in here so you will see no mushrooms at all. No fungus has enough of the corner on the energy, the food resources in that pile to be able to make mushrooms. So you're at intermediate level, keep going. Okay. Um, question here is, does the microbiology affect plant genetics? Um, no, not that we're aware of. Um, okay. I'm not, I've never heard of you know, like a bacteria bearing a plasmid, you know, uh, kind of mating with a eukaryotic um, cell, that just would never happen because it's just completely different mechanisms for reproduction when you're dealing with prokaryotes as compared to eukaryotes. Um, yeah, I just don't think you'd have to worry about that. Okay. Um, I'm just reading through. There's a lot of comments in here. Hopefully all good ones. Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of people chatting too. Um, uh, heard of uh, buckwheat producing exudates that make phosphorus more bioavailable. Um, is there an optimum time in buckwheat's lifespan to chop it to have more phosphorus bioavailability for cannabis, they're asking, but I guess it wouldn't really matter what plant you're growing. See, that's usually more dependent on the biology you have in that system, not really something that's going on in the plant. Uh, you know, the plant's got a produce the exudates, it's got to have the organisms in the soil to get the phosphorus or get whatever nutrient the plant wants. And what's usually lacking is the biology in the soil. That's where, because we destroyed that food web when we were back in the chemical days, um, all those toxic chemicals, all that tillage, all those um, you know, salts, inorganic fertilizers, just wiped out the biology. And so your plant couldn't get what it wants. When you see a lack like that, it's probably that the soil doesn't have the organisms back that the plant needs. More compost is needed. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm still reading through comments here. I got a, I guess I got my own question. So uh, <laughs> let's say I have a pretty decent source of compost that I'm buying commercially. Like it's pretty solid. It's not like high, like, Maybe it's like just medium grade or whatever you want to call it. How do I take that and like kick it up a notch? You're saying add inoculants, right? What would be like some simple things that I could do to do that? Well, what I'd encourage you to do first is um, get 
um, a sample of that compost and look at it using the microscope and see what's okay. missing. So now you can focus on what's actually missing and not just generally try to um, inoculate put lots of stuff in there and cross your fingers and hope that you put in what was lacking. Now you know what is lacking. So now you know that you've got to make a protozoan infusion. Okay, and we go through with you on how to make that protozoan infusion and make sure that you're putting back in the missing organisms or say with bacteria or fungi, where would you go out and find a good broad spectrum, high diversity set of bacteria or set of fungi? Where are the habitats? Where do you want to go looking? And then when you bring that material back, look at it with your microscope. Is this really high? in those organisms and so now you might want to take a small amount of your compost mix in um, this uh, additional inoculum get it grown in there and then there's your inoculum that goes back into your pile and voila you have the uh, fungi or the protozoa or the nematodes that you want so it's pretty easy to add back in most anything that is missing you might want to have some local indigenous um, places that you know to go collect. Where are the really good old growth forests around you? Do you have any at all? One of the things that really concerns me in California is in the last uh, probably four years, uh, we're seeing a real drop off in the beneficial fungi in all the forests in California. They aren't there. You don't have a source of really good quality diversity of fungi and high and the really good fungi they're they're disappearing from the forests so what do you do but you're going to have to come up to oregon and hope that when you collect some of our fungi that you take it back and it's going to be able to live under your conditions well you know southern california nope you're not coming to oregon don't bother our Oregon uh, microorganisms aren't going to survive in Southern Cal. Where are you going to go? Um, so you head to Utah. You head to places that have similar um, um, climatic regimes, and you collect small amounts. Please don't destroy the habitat from which you are collecting, because maybe next year you're going to need to come back. And mm -hmm. if that's been destroyed, where are we going to find them? Right. And that's another reason why we all have to start using these methods. We've got to go back to you know, building our soil up again, or we will lose these really critically important organisms. We won't have them to grow food with anymore. Okay. Um, I got I get this question asked like all the time, but um, what's your opinion on the sort of back to Eden style gardening? Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Back to Eden? No, I don't really know what that is. Okay. So, um, there's a farmer who's famous for this, and he just lays down wood chips and wood chips and wood chips and wood chips, and that's it. And sort of it creates a mulch, and then the, the what's underneath breaks down over time, and you can just pull the wood chips away and plant into it. And that's basically how it works. I don't know if you've heard about that, or do you have an opinion about that? Well, yeah, it, what you're describing is somebody who's composting in place. Um, because the, the residues from last year's um, um, plants, they're going to fall to the surface of the, of the soil. You're going to cover them with wood chips. Well, there you go. You've got everything except the high nitrogen. Nitrogen, and yeah. So, yep. so you're composting in place. You, you've got the foods for the fungi, you've got the foods for the bacteria. And so you're just composting. The only danger there is if you walk down those paths, if you walk over that material too much, you compact it. And then it becomes a swamp. And that can get pretty ugly. So just be careful about not having too many visitors come to your garden and uh, walking through it all. One or two people, no problem. 10 or 20 people a day, well, you're developing a problem in those paths. So it, you know, it sounds pretty good. If you can wait the, the time that it's going to take for really good soil to develop, it may take five or six years, maybe 10 years. So could you speed things along by going and getting inocula? Yes, of course you could. You know, okay. Make a few compost teas and, and get them put out on top of everything, and it just goes faster. 
Okay. Um, so I know we're, we've been, we've been at this for a while, Elaine. I could probably talk to you for hours and I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I'll try to get a couple more questions in. Um, uh, Blake, uh, Chastain is asking if planting a large scale fruit forest, would you start with grasses? Um, yeah, it's, that's kind of problematical because the grasses, you know, even the most productive grasses that we, we have maybe only have a ratio of two times more fungi to bacteria. And what trees need, the orchard trees typically need somewhere around a, a fungal to bacterial ratio, like around 10 times more fungal biomass than bacterial biomass in the soil, but up to maybe a hundred times more fungi than bacteria. And so it, if you're putting in grasses, you're, kind of setting the stage for shrubby things more than the trees. So when you go to plant your tree, make certain that you've got really good fungal biomass that you're going to be putting into that hole where you're going to be planting the tree. And, and typically we like to go, um, you know, you, you dig the hole two or three inches wider than you really need it to be because you're gonna take your compost and mix it about 50-50 in the, all the outside edges of that hole. And then you're gonna mix just a handful or two of that site soil that's probably not fungal enough into that really good fungal compost material and that's where you actually plant your tree. And your tree's gonna just take off. Um, we want those root systems on those trees to be going straight down and then if you've got this done right, you know, the roots may grow out to the edge of the hole where you dug and they're gonna be going, oh, this is not really the place I wanna live. This is way too bacterial, which encourages the roots of those trees to go way deep. And um, then you, you usually get, like when we deal with grapevines or when we deal with um, most kinds of uh, walnuts or, um, you know, what hazelnut here in Oregon, number of other things. Normally it takes somewhere around four to maybe five years for those trees to start producing. We will see production starting to occur, occur at year um, three to maybe four. So they grow very rapidly. They um, are very healthy. Uh, they don't split their bark at all and you're starting to get production much earlier than you would expect. Okay. Uh, how about biochar? What's your opinion about biochar? If you've got material that is um, extremely compacted, has um, no good structure, tilling in biochar is a physical thing. They, it's going to open that soil up and let oxygen, uh, moisture, um, water, roots, um, can grow much deeper if they've got those physical spaces. If you treat your biochar with biology, so go spritz a compost tea on it, let it soak in compost tea overnight, go put it into a pond where you put in really good biology and um, you know, then take it out, you know, a bag of that biochar, then it's real biochar. I object to people who call something biochar when all it is is charcoal. That's not biochar. The process of turning, making that, that charcoal, uh, the temperatures were so high, the, the conditions were so low in oxygen, there is no self-respecting good guy organism that has survived that treatment. So you're gonna have to put that biology back into the biochar. And those products where they actually have made certain that the biology is back, those products do much better. People are much more satisfied with the effects that they're seeing on their plants. If it's just charcoal, guys, you can make your own charcoal. Um, why pay so much more for it? So be a little careful on that issue. Okay. Um, and can you talk, I know we're, I'm, we're pushing up on time here. Can we talk a, uh, for a minute or two about KNF and how you feel about that right now and some of the techniques that are being developed with that and being used? With KNF? Korean natural farming. Oh, ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I don't, yeah, no, it's all right. I don't turn things into initials all the time. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of things in Korean natural farming that 
are you know pretty much right on. I have no objections. Um, there's just a few things where they haven't really thought the biology through. It's like when you take a rice ball and you go throw it out into the forest. Well, in Japan, you go throw it out into the forest and you're going to get the microorganisms from that forest area that can colonize rice. Well, rice isn't a really complex food resource. It's really not going to get the fungi that you want. It's going to you know, attract the bacteria, uh, but you know, protozoa, nematodes, no, most of the time we don't leave things out long enough for the good populations of those organisms to get established. But you're, you know, you're really selecting for much more of the bacterial community. Well, I can bet you, and I would probably be right every single time. So please bet me on this. Um, if you're starting to deal with um, soil, uh, a farm that has been in toxic chemical mode, uh, tilled a lot, you know, all kinds of inorganic fertilizers, the only thing left are the bacteria. So you're going to put more bacteria into something that's already got too much bacteria. What you need are the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods. Those things are what you need, and you're not going to get them carried around on a rice ball. When they come to the United States, and now they're going to take a ball of rice, and they're going to go throw it out into the old growth forest, when has rice ever been grown in our high country, you know, the Sierra Nevadas and the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades. There's never been any rice here. So there are no organisms that you're really going to collect on those rice balls, except for the disease causing organisms. Hmm. And that's okay. what we see most of the time is they're highly undesirable. So instead of rice, could you go get, you know, plant material that is indigenous? And you'd have a much better um, likelihood of picking up the, the good guys. Don't put just starch into your ball. Make sure you've, you've got some fungal foods in there. So, you know, green, bacterial foods, woody, fungal foods. Make a, I don't know, a cranberry, you know, mush the cranberries up and then put a bunch of uh, toothpicks in there or something and put that out in the forest. And you're gonna get a better, much better inoculum um, than putting rice balls out. Okay. Um, has anyone like, I know that that's been the strategies with the rice to collect the indigenous microorganisms, but like, are there other recipes for, has that been like sorted out at all? Like in different parts of the world, like people using other things, or is that really like what you're talking about? Is there other strategies there with making that collection device, I guess? I, I'm not aware of them, you know, okay. it's, it's just, you know, we, we have, I've just started going, wait, guys, you got to think about what you're doing. What, what are the foods you're putting out there? What are you getting growing on these balls? And so those have to be altered. It's kind of like in the world of um, permaculture, you know, Bill Mollison was the person who developed these concepts in Australia. And so when he was talking about companion plants, those were companion plants in Australia. They are not necessarily companion plants here in the United States. I don't know where the um, permaculturalists came up with the idea that chamomile or you know, nettles were high in nitrogen. They're not fixed. They're not nitrogen fixers. They do not give you the um, effects that you want if you put them into a compost pile saying it's high nitrogen, they are not high nitrogen. Nettles may be high in nitrate, but that does not mean the C to N of that plant material is down around five to 10. It has a you know, carbon nitrogen ratio up around 30, lots of, lots of nitrate, but is it nitrate that you want in your soil? No, that's a good way to grow weeds. So think through things that other groups of people where somebody says something that you're going, wait, how does, how could that possibly work? I've learned these mechanisms and that doesn't fit any mechanism that I've been taught. Okay. Uh, so we're up on an hour and a half. I'm going to ask you one last question and then, uh, <laughs> 
Um, someone asked about the Johnson Sioux um, compost bioreactor. Are you familiar yeah. with that system? Yeah, yeah. I, um, How- I was around as it was being developed. I don't okay. know. Should, should I claim partial credit? No, nah, let's not worry about it. It's just too, <laughs> you know. Yep, I know that bioreactor, and it works very well. You do have to pay attention, though, that, you know, where they're putting all of those pipes down into to get good air circulation. Hot air rises, and there goes most of your water as well. So um, you want to be a little careful um, as you start using that bioreactor in different climates. You have to change the way you're doing things. So, for instance, they put... um, a layer of um, weed cloth around the wire cage that the, they make their compost in. And, and I've made my compost piles in those wire cages for the last 30 years. Um, so we've been doing very comparable things. Um, if you put that weed cloth there, then you're restricting airflow. You're restricting um loss of water as well. And in a very uh, dry, arid system, the loss of water is way more important than restricting airflow just a little bit. But now you go to a, a climate like, uh, you know, uh, North Carolina or Virginia or um, Vermont in the summertime, and you're dealing with um, atmospheres that are so humid, so mm-hmm. hot, don't put that wire, don't put that weed cloth around the, uh, between your compost pile and the metal wire because you're just going to restrict um, airflow so badly that you're going to go anaerobic and you're just, you're putting all those little um, PVC pipes down into the pile and you're going, it's going anaerobic and I've only got an inch and a half in between each and every one of my pipes. What am I, how can I do this? Take the weed cloth off. All right, too so much moisture. Just, yep, just think it through. Okay, cool. Well, Elaine, uh, this has been awesome. Um, thank you so much. Um, if you want to just hang around for a second, I forgot to mention the, to that before, but I'm going to close out the show. And uh, thanks again, Elaine. Thanks for everything that you do for, for farmers and the community out there. And, you know, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. <laughs> yep. Well, come take the classes. So sign up and um, get a firm understanding of the reason well, it's so important to have a good food web in your soil. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I want to tell you about the brand new courses that Dr. Lane Ingham has just launched. I know we've already been talking about this tonight, but as you may know, Dr. Ingham is considered by many to be the world's foremost soil biologist. She has spent the last four decades pioneering research into how plants and microbes work together. Dr. Ingham has helped farmers around the world to reduce their chemical inputs and to simultaneously increase their yield and profits. With knowledge from these courses, you'll be able to use a microscope to quantify microbes in the soil, have the skills to help these microbes reproduce, and the know-how to regenerate the biome in your soils. The all-new Soil Food Web Foundation courses are being offered with a special introductory offer of $1,600 off for the first 150 students. So if you'd like to join the soil revolution, then please go to www.soilfoodweb.com today. And if you haven't already realized after listening to Dr. Elaine Ingham for the last hour and a half, how cool the stuff she has going on, and you should really go check that out if you want to learn more. So I highly recommend that, and uh, thank you to Dr. Ingham for being on the show tonight, but also being a supporter of no-till growers in general. So uh, with that, guys, if you haven't already, please hit the like button down below. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, please do that too. Uh, Stay posted. Uh, We'll be posting about our next show. I'm not sure exactly when that's going to be at this moment, but we will be doing these periodically. So keep a lookout for that. And also, as you may or may not know, we do turn these into um, audio uh, files for the Patreon members too. So if you want to Throw this in your phone and listen to it later. It'll be up uh, available hopefully within a day or two after the show. So thank you guys so much tonight. I really appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you soon.